there's so much to talk about, and uh, we talked about a lot of the things that we need to talk about uh, yesterday. There were some great presentations. I missed a few presentations. I missed some of the panel discussions, uh, but those that I saw were enlightening uh, and, and significant. So uh, I'm going to try to be equally significant and enlightening this morning. Uh, and, uh, but I can only talk about one subject. I'm going to talk about data, uh, which is uh, a, a new responsibility for us in this industry and an obligation, but a, an opportunity, of course. So I will talk about the, a little bit about the general data protection regulation, although I'm not an attorney, so I'm not going to dig too deeply into this, but I am going to strongly suggest that you dig very deeply into this. Again, I believe you're obligated to do so. Uh, we have regulations of our own in the US, but they are not nearly as onerous and specific uh, as these are. And these uh, will require, and as I'm sure you all know, are requiring quite a bit of attention. And uh, it's something we can't avoid because data is at the core of what we're trying to do now uh, with connected vehicles. I will talk about the VDA neutral server uh, initiative, uh, which is uh, part of the on-ramp to GDPR and uh, an industry reaction to GDPR and BMW and, and what they're doing in response to that, which again is, is important and uh, I believe serves as a model for how to respond to this new requirement. I'll talk about what's really going on uh, behind the scenes and what this all means and what this means to you. Uh, and I will conclude with a second section of the, of the presentation talking about the Cambrian explosion that's uh, affecting our industry and why this is happening again. So we have the GDPR, and I just put this here to give you a sense of some of the top line issues that are involved, and these were highlighted uh, by a, a source online uh, called Baronis, who will be happy to help you resolve these issues. My takeaway is uh, not only such specific issues as the right to erasure, security of processing, notification of personal data, data breach, et cetera, but the fact that this is Article 17, Article 32, Article 25. Obviously, this is a massive document, uh, a, a non-trivial exercise. And again, not being an attorney, I would recommend that you get professionals involved if you don't already have professionals involved. Uh, so contact your attorneys and security professionals to respond to this proposition. But the, a key takeaway, I, I think, can be summarized at the top line is minimize data collected, especially personally identifiable information from consumers, do not retain personal data beyond its original purpose and give consumers access and ownership of their data. So there were some questions yesterday about who owns the data and there should be no mystery about this, uh, although there has been some confusion over the years and that is the consumer owns the data. Now I've always found this to be a bit of a, 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 an inside joke among the car makers. OnStar was always fond and is always fond of saying the consumer owns the data. The problem is, if you are a user of OnStar, how do you get to your data? How do you control your data? Uh, how do you protect your data? So GDPR is intended to, to, to achieve that goal. And I, I believe that if there is transparency and control on the part of the customer, there will be trust. And we're going to need trust to achieve an opt-in proposition. We want our customers to participate. We want them to opt in. And that is the world we are entering into. The car is going to become like your phone where you're sliding over the, yes, share my data with these companies, don't share my data with these people, which is what is behind VDA and what is behind what BMW is doing. So the VDA uh, proposition, the two core bullet points are that each, o each OEM has the role of a system administrator and takes responsibility for the safe and secure transfer of vehicle generated data from the vehicle to a standardized and maintained business-to-business -business OEM interface. The point of this proposition is that the OEM is going to take control of, of the vehicle data coming out of the car from the wireless connection, which will be in every car in the not distant future. So we don't have to talk about percent of cars that are connected. In a very short timeline, all cars will be connected that are coming out of the factory. And the data coming out of those cars will go to a neutral server and the OEM will have control of that and the insurance company will go to the OEM as many are doing today as opposed to using an aftermarket device to get access to that data. And the consumer will be, have visibility to that data via a portal and have control over that data either via an app or via the portal. Uh, but again, transparency control which brings trust. Now, there's a third purpose of what VDA is doing which is 
they really would love to shut down the OBD2 port in the car. Uh, what some uh, car makers are trying to do, first of all, is create a secure gateway and some kind of a firewall. Uh, secondarily, they're trying to disable the functioning of that port when the vehicle is in motion. I don't believe uh, that that uh, has been determined whether it's necessarily legal yet at this time, because certainly when you're testing a vehicle, you're simulating a vehicle in operation. So if you're disabling that proposition, it kind of doesn't make sense. But nevertheless, in Europe, there's a very significant effort, and I would say uh, American uh, US uh, car makers would be similarly inclined to shut down that port. We're not really capable of doing that. The good news is, however, is that companies that have been primarily insurance companies that have been trying to tap into that port as a consumer B2C proposition have discovered that it's very problematic. Consumers don't plug the device in or it falls out or they take it out. And some of those devices have been recalled. They've caused problems. And certainly it's a sub security vulnerability. So uh, the future of data extraction and interpretation from vehicles really is going to be primarily directly from the car manufacturers. And that, is, that revolution is already being felt in the insurance industry and it will be felt, I think, in other industries as well. Now, what you have is car clubs, insurance companies, and independent repair shops completely up in arms in Europe in particular, and all the associations that are associated with those groups saying that this is unfair, they want direct access to the vehicle data. Well, they can still plug in their devices, they can still have physically installed devices on cars, of which there are millions already, but the vast majority of data collection and sharing will happen through the OEMs. In the US, we're sort of in the minor leagues when it comes to privacy principles. So these are more like guidelines, you know, transparency. Manufacturers will provide clear and concise privacy po policies. Yeah, right. Bought a car in the U.S. lately? Not very clear or concise. Big piles of documents to read. Affirmative consent of, for sensitive data, geolocation, biometric driver behavior. Sort of, maybe, not really. Uh, limited sharing with government and law enforcement. Again, not really, as long as there's a subpoena you know, your data is going to be freely available. So the U.S. is, you know, in the junior league when it comes to dealing with this stuff. You know, the EU has laid down the law. So, uh, and it, it may be that the U.S. follows that model, but it does put pressure on you when you're bringing these solutions to market uh, to pay attention to those details. But there's huge value in this data. Now, I had a vision of providing, you know, value for each type of data, but it's actually quite a complex conversation. And so I it's more suitable for a consulting session than a presentation at an event like this. So I just wanted to emphasize the fact that some of this was already conveyed by here, by Ralph Hertwig in his presentation very eloquently, I thought, although I thought he could have gone further and I thought he should have made it more clear that the value proposition that here is presenting to the industry uh, in conjunction with Audi, Daimler, and BMW is a revolution. Uh, data sharing between OEMs, unheard of, and uh, the unspoken word in his presentation, the unspoken name, the name that shall not be expressed, was Waze, okay? So this is a Waze-like proposition that uh, he was talking about, where you're sharing data and collecting data from vehicles. It's really an amazing thing. Uh, and I didn't even think he made a good example with the uh, windshield wiper data correlating to flooding in Berlin. Um, I think there, there was a more complex story to be told there, and they actually can tell it. Uh, but, that's, but it's the beginning of something very big that everybody should be quite aware of. But weather data, traffic data, road hazard data, all of this is going to be uh, crowdsourced. We're going to have Schwarm intelli intelligence. Uh, this, is, this is what's happening in the industry. And I would say Europe is in the forefront uh, of leading this, this uh, activity. Uh, it's ironic because OnStar has been around for 20 years and still does not collect uh, probe data from their internal combustion vehicles. They do collect probe data from their electric vehicles like the Bolt. Um, so vehicle sensor data can be communicated without driver intervention. So Waze, typically, you have to do something with the app to indicate a road hazard or you've seen a police officer. Uh, we're talking about platforms in, in our industry via the embedded modem that don't require any human intervention at all, no driver distraction. These are just some examples of some of the data that's being collected from some of the European car makers. Uh, this is from Adiatse. And I think it's worth noting that BMW is collecting in Europe on an annual basis a petabyte of data, which breaks down to about a gigabyte per car per year, and something equivalent in the US. And the importance of that is twofold. Number one, BMW is probably still trying to figure out what to do with all that data, okay? There's a, a huge reservoir of value, and I believe they've only just scratched the surface of that, just tapped into it a little bit, so they're still learning. But they put a stake in the ground. 
that's the beginning, okay? Now, I'm not one of these uh, analysts or consultants that's going to tell you we're gonna be getting terabytes of data from the car every day or every week. Uh, that kind of volume of data might come off a test drive, you know, a, an autonomous vehicle mule, okay, that's, that's doing uh, testing or development activity. Uh, but a gigabyte per year from car, that is a big change, uh, and that is the direction of the industry. And BMW is not alone. So PSA is collecting similar amounts of data. I dare say JLR is probably in that vicinity as well. But I would put BMW in the forefront of this effort, and, and I wouldn't discount Daimler. Uh, and this is the BMW car data platform. It's only in the earliest stages, so you, know, you don't have your little sliders yet and customer control, and there's very little to see. Uh, but they, again, BMW is in the forefront, and I think it, it's worth watching what they're doing because they are leading in this activity. But we have a big challenge uh, in the industry because we have a lot of data on consumers, and it's coming from a variety of parts of the organization within our industry, where we're selling cars, where we're servicing them, uh, the entire process of people shopping for cars or looking for a place to get their car repaired or maybe reviewing cars or complaining about cars on social media. Uh, of course, our insurance history, et cetera. As an industry, we need to do a better job of bringing all of this information together in an aggregated, orchestrated, coordinated way to engage more intelligently with the consumer. There's two important takeaways I want to communicate with you, uh, and I think some of you are, have already put two and two together on these issues, but just to make sure, number one, the car is a browser. Everything you do in the car is an indication of intention. And more often than not, if you're in a car going somewhere, you're in the process of engaging in some kind of a commercial activity. And in fact, the car may be the last opportunity to influence your commercial behavior before you actually engage in that behavior, which is, speaks to the importance of radio, but that's a whole other presentation. But the car as a browser is an important concept to understand, and that's why vehicle data is so important. Everything you do in that car indicates some kind of intention. More importantly, and what's uh, emerged uh, very recently is Ford acquired Canvas, which is a subscription-based program, and there's some of the pricing here in the mission statement for Canvas, and Zipcar has adjusted their subscription program. So the car, mobility as a service, okay? So we should be using the data of vehicle usage. My uh, BMW dealer or BMW itself should be looking at my behavior and saying, it doesn't make sense for Roger to own a BMW because he's always over giving keynotes in Munich and his car is sitting in the driveway half the time or three quarters of the time. So there must be a different ownership model that would better serve him and probably save him a lot of money and allow us to up the utilization of that vehicle. We need to make those kinds of choices and decisions to better serve our customers with more creative business models and the subscription, the mobility as a subscription uh, is part of that vision uh, and could lead to not only uh, more people using cars, uh, but just more flexible and greater utilization of the cars that we're creating instead of just having them sit around. Now, I get to the fun part, okay? Market forces and evolution. So I picked up a book recently, Driverless, and in this book, it talks about how the Cambrian explosion. So I'm sure many of you have heard about the Cambrian explosion, but there is a theory called light switch theory that says the Cambrian explosion came about because of the onset of sight, okay? That sight created new opportunities for predation. It, it led to uh, different uh, 38 animal phyla where there had only been three. And uh, it just, a, an expansion of the brain because suddenly you had not only sight, but you also had sense of smell and touch and other senses that required a more complex brain. I think you see where I'm going with this. Uh, we are getting more use of, so this is the book, more use of cameras and sight in vehicles and other sensors, and we're seeing more powerful processing going into the car, data collection, and the need to have a better capability to analyze that data on the edge, in the vehicle, in the cloud. So we are going through our own Cambrian explosion right now in the car. And I think it's worth knowing that uh, Masayoshi Son of SoftBank, too, sees a Cambrian explosion associated with IoT. So he sees it associated with connectivity and connecting all things. But in this community, we see it as arising from camera technology, vision technology, vision systems coming to the car, sensing, more uh, elaborate sensing systems coming to the car. 
Now, I love the automotive industry because we seem to have, if you look globally, unmitigated growth uh, uh, off into the horizon uh, indefinitely, in spite of some of the alarmist uh, forecasts. Uh, and that's what you see reflected in the uh, production forecast uh, on the left. On the right, uh, you see the growth is coming in emerging markets, and it's pretty substantial growth. Okay, so our markets are, you know, NAFTA and Europe are relatively mature, but the emerging markets are growing rapidly, and it's good to see Brazil bouncing back. Automotive system demand is growing even faster, and by system demand, I mean electronic systems. Okay, so if you look at semiconductor growth, that growth is coming from SOCs. Those are the powerful brains in the cars. That's where some of the, the biggest growth is coming from and memory, because we're going to be collecting a lot of data in the car, and we're going to be enabling software updates, so we're going to need more storage capacity in the car. Sensors, ADAS, not surprisingly, the biggest growth area, the vast majority of this is cameras, and that's not only cameras outside the car, but cameras inside the car, but also uh, other sensing categories as well, LIDAR, radar, uh, uh, ultrasonic, et cetera. So, whoops. And there's further growth coming from uh, electrification generally. So uh, electric vehicles are driving a significant amount of growth, but ADAS is a huge growth area. And this is what's driving the creation of entirely new kinds of vehicles, entirely new kinds of customer relationships, entirely new opportunities. And it's driven by connectivity and it's driven by data and the data that's going to be collected by those sensors and the intelligence that it's creating, the value propositions that it's creating. I would say the irony in our industry is that we keep trying to charge the customer a subscription for that connection in the car when the reality is we should either be paying the customer for that connection or certainly making it free and just part of the car because the value of the data is so incredible for changing our relationships with the consumers, changing our relationships with the car and enabling new business models and new value propositions for the industry. I'm, I'm sure it's no mystery to you that the expectation of many car makers like Audi, uh, is, uh, that, which has stated it in uh, particularly, is that they foresee the value of their cars deriving in the future from software and service delivery more than from the vehicles themselves, more than just moving the hardware but we're in very, very early stages here. So what does this mean to you? So in summary, the need for safety drives sensor adoption. Primarily cameras, but not solely, but cameras are a key part of this proposition. And I'm sure you've seen many companies that seem to be very simple in what they're doing, doing uh, everything with cameras alone. Uh, but uh, certainly cameras and radar uh, certainly is what Tesla is, is doing, and I think we're going to see low-cost LiDAR as well. More cameras equals more information and data, and the need for more software. More data and software equals a need for faster in-vehicle networks. So we heard about HD base T here. Certainly we're hearing about Ethernet in the car. Faster throughput in the car. CAN is not going to do it, okay? So we want to, we have several suppliers here talking about over-the-air software updates. Our cars are really not ideally architected to handle those software updates. Uh, the network is slow, it's not very secure, and the ECUs are not properly configured to handle software updates today. And things don't change very quickly in this industry, although if Volkswagen's presentation is to be believed, maybe things are going to, be start, are going to start changing a little more rapidly, and certainly they need to in order to support this proposition that's emerging. So software updates, security. A lot of people I spoke to yesterday, and I'm sure many of the people you spoke to yesterday have told you security should be the number one priority, uh, and there's no answer, e's certainly not an easy one, in sight. It's the need for software updates and security, and those two go together. You're not going to have a secure car if it's not connected, okay? That's, that's core. So the need for connectivity. Connected and increasingly autonomous cars equal mobility as a service. So not only is the data and connectivity enabling this, this opportunity, but we're getting to autonomous, and so then we can have a, a wide open way of using cars and accessing transportation. Vehicles coming to you on demand, it's like Audi on demand and other on demand services. Now, in the short term, there will be human beings involved, but perhaps not in the long run, we shall see. 
Finally, mobility as a service equals new forms of customer acquisition, customer interaction, customer engagement, and more importantly, customer retention. Okay, so embedding a device in a car, that's about customer retention. That's why we shouldn't be charging a subscription for that connection in the car. That should be the glue that's holding this proposition together. And the rest is an opportunity to expand the network beyond just the owners of our cars per se. We need to reach out and use these technologies to reach out to people who maybe don't own or don't want to own a car, but need to get around and could use a car to get around. And we can enable that with these technologies. So welcome to the Carmbrian explosion, okay? That wasn't a big enough groan. All right. Uh, and this was evidenced just a few weeks ago here in Munich uh, at the GTC event where uh, Jensen Huang was talking about shifting their focus because their focus had been on infotainment systems and now it's on robo-taxis. And of course, Jensen fancies himself the coolest guy in the automotive semiconductor industry uh, with his leather jacket. I, I couldn't get one for this uh, presentation myself, but um, he's talking about robo-taxis being cool and that's a big deal. And that robo-taxis is the target now. And he's talking about taking that trunk full of computers and turning it into a, a board the size of a license plate to enable this Carmbrian explosion, okay? Which means different cars, different customer relationships, different use cases. Uh, and so we have new, new phyla, auto autonomous, <laughs> robo taxis, okay? Uh, and that's where we're headed and that's what data and connectivity is going to enable. So that's what I wanted to leave you with. I don't know if I have any time left for questions, but it's up to you, Annie. Thank you very much. <laughs>